So all of that is to say that if work is such a major portion of our lives, what, if anything, does God have to say about that? When it comes to, to God and the Bible, uh, does the Holy Spirit uh, simply talk to us about spiritual kinds of things, you know, like the church? Does he just talk about uh, the kinds of things in our living that we should or should not do? Does he just talk about our families and our interpersonal relationships with others in our world? Or has he said anything to us directly and importantly about the subject of our vocations and the work that we do? Well, again, as I mentioned, if you've been with us over the last couple of, of months, you know that we've been studying through this New Testament book of Colossians. And it is nothing if not practical. And we're going to get there again this morning, as I said. But before we do that, um, I want us to consider a little bit about what God may have said about work. And I think it would be helpful for us to realize and remember some of these things that can kind of help set the, uh, the context for us in what we're going to be looking at in the book of Colossians. So let me give these to you just quickly if I can. We could call it a biblical theology of work, 10 points, 10 quick points. Let me give them to you. Number one, remember that God himself created this universe through work. You see the scripture text there, Genesis chapter two, by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So, God knows intimately what it means to work. After all, he instituted it. He invented it, right? Number two, it is the work of God that can cause men and women to understand who God really is. In Psalm 8, it reads, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens from the mouth of infants and nursing babes. You have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him? And the son of man that you care for him, yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, also all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the seas, O Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So you see, in large part, it is the result of the work of God that we can understand who God is and what he's all about. Number three, God made man and woman in his image to be workers. Again, Genesis chapter two, then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. God created mankind with the capacity to work, and in fact, God gave man a job to do with a position description. I think this teaches us, too, that paradise, ultimately, will not be a place of idleness. When we finally reach heaven and our eternal home, we will not simply be floating around on clouds and spending our, our time just eating bonbons together. God has given us jobs to do. Number four, God commanded that we should not overwork. There is such a thing as too much of a good thing, and that's called a bad thing. Remember uh, Exodus chapter 20, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Shabbat, a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in 
uh, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You see this as well in the book of Exodus, chapter 23. Six days you're supposed to do your work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from labor so that your ox and your donkey may rest and the son of your female slaves as well as your stranger may refresh themselves. God commanded us that we should rest from our work. There is a natural rhythm to our bodies and to our minds that works best when we have a healthy work-life balance. Number five, God promised to bless his people's work if they would obey his word. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 30, then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hand, in the offspring of your body and in the offspring of your cattle and in the produce of your ground for the Lord will again rejoice over you for good just as he rejoiced over your fathers if you obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Israel as a nation learned the principle that obedience results in life blessing. Number six, work minus a relationship with and purpose in God can be a meaningless exercise. Ecclesiastes 2, for there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool, inasmuch as in the coming days all will be forgotten, and how the wise man and the fool alike, they're going to die. So I hated life, for the work which I had been given done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after wind. Thus, I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who's going to be coming after me. So, without a doubt, work, apart from God, and apart from God's purposes, can be meaningless. It can be self-serving and tiresome and unfulfilling and an exercise in futility. One of the horrific stories that... um, came from the concentration camps of World War II that has kind of always stuck in my mind was the story of one camp where the prisoners were directed by the guards each day to dig a large hole in the compound with picks and shovels. And then at the end of that day, they were instructed to fill that hole back up with dirt. And that went on day after day after week after month. And what resulted was not so much frustration or exhaustion, but rather despair. And people began to take their own lives because they didn't have any sense of purposefulness or hope of things being any different for them. Number seven, God identifies someone who will not work as a sluggard and a fool. Proverbs 21, the desire of the sluggard puts him to death, for his hands refuse to work. All day long he is craving, while the righteous gives and does not hold back. Or Proverbs 24, I passed by the field of the sluggard and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense, and behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles, its surface was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. When I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then your poverty will come as a robber and your want like an an armed man. Number eight, diligent work should in fact mark God's people. That is, Jesus Christ's followers should be the very best employees and employers that this world really ever sets its eyes on. 1 Thessalonians 4, but we urge you, Paul said, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. And 2 Thessalonians, likewise, for even when we were with you, he said, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he's not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. And here's a good one. Pastors and teaching leaders of the church should set the pace in hard work. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, 
Paul writes to Timothy saying, take pains with these things, that is your teaching and your exhortation and the exercise of your gift, be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching, persevere in these things, for as you do, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. And then lastly, number 10, we are all to work with a mind set above on the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so, as I said, this gets us to our next up passage of scripture, uh, the text for today, which is Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 through chapter 4, verse 1. And that reads, slaves, now understand here historically and uh, contextually that upwards of one-third of the population in the first century world were slaves. So these were really the ancient world equivalents of our modern day workers and employees, okay? So again, slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not just with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. And verse 1 of chapter 4, which is part of this context, says, Masters, or you could transpose the word there, employers, grant to your slaves, that is your workers, your employees, justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. All right, now, the powerful principle and the big idea that is embedded in these last verses we just read is this. When Jesus Christ is supreme and when he is central to you, as Paul has been talking about all throughout the book of Colossians up to this point for the first three chapters, when Jesus Christ is supreme and central to you, work matters. 